This is take four, the first good take for the introduction <laughs> to the Mazu Temple. Well, friends, any of you who were on Playa in 2015 will likely remember Mazu Temple, whether you knew what it was called or not. It was just off the Esplanade at about well, 5 o'clock, had a uh, really lovely lotus-shaped roof, uh, beautiful dragons around the perimeter, and two big demons outlying. Nifty little fortune-telling spots on the inside, places to light incense. The good news is, if you're listening to this, you saw the two photos associated with this podcast. So you actually know what the thing we're talking about looks like. <laughs> and that was an intro that, with D-Day and Rex. Yeah, that was, that was a bit of something. That was, that was some words in a particular order conveying a certain quantity of information. Can probably delete this one. Can probably delete this one. It's all right. Let's keep going. Hi, Beth. <laughs> Mark! But the point is, this is Accuracy 3rd, and I'm D-Day. And I'm Rex. And today we're going to be hearing from Nathan, who was, let's call it, lead artist for Mazu Temple. Uh, but it's so much more interesting and complicated than that. And let's let Nathan tell us about it. Nathan, last year you worked on the Mazu Temple. Correct. How did you get involved in that project? I had been traveling around Southeast Asia for most of the year prior and wound up in Taiwan sort of unexpectedly for about a month before coming back to the States. Shortly after coming back to the States, started up DPW season in 2014 and happened to find myself behind uh, Dave X in line at, at the commissary at Burning Man. And for our listeners who don't know, Dave X is the man responsible for all of the awesome fireworks you see every year. Yep. And for the other listeners who don't know, the commissary is basically the Burning Man Volunteers High School Cafeteria <laughs> with all of the ensuing cliques and uh, people that you see this year that you slept with last year that you really don't want to talk to this year, as you probably experienced in high school. Pretty much. As a side note, there's a word in Russian specifically for the feeling you get when there's someone that you were very intimate with and parted in sort of awkward terms and haven't seen in a while and then run into again in a pu unexpectedly in a public place. There's a word for that feeling in Russian. Wow. God, they are so good with their emotions. Right? If only they'd express them. <laughs> we do not do that. No, we know what they are. And we live them where they go. Yeah. So anyway, I happen to be standing behind Dave X in line. You know, it's like a hot dog and tater tot kind of day and make some joke about mystery meat. And he re replies with something about something something Taiwanese street food. I kind of perk up. I'm like, I was I was just in Taiwan. He's like, really? I was just in Taiwan. What were you doing there? And he mentions this group that's out there called the Dream Community, and says they're a group of crazy artists out there who a couple of them had been to Burning Man. They've been trying to bring a project out there for a while. He says I should look them up. You know, I I've, I've been at this point on the road kind of all over the world for two and a half years. Wrap up the Burning Man season, no real idea what I'm doing. Send these guys an email and be like, hey, I hear you guys are looking to do a thing. And through some slightly choppy English, uh, I'm given to understand that they will fly me out there, that they are looking for a consultant, is is how I read the situation. Uh, it helps them navigate Burning Man bureaucracy. Like They have a plan, the, a piece they want to make. And I'm like, well, great. That gets me across the Pacific and I'll hang out for a month, get their uh, letter of intent into the art department and be on my merry way. Mm -hmm. So I show up in December of 2014 and meet with them and, you know, so tell me about your plan. What can I do to help you make this thing happen? And they look at me and they say, so tell us about your plan. <laughs> <laughs> They weren't hiring you as a consultant. They wanted you to be the artist. Right. Which I discovered upon arriving. They, they had nothing at all. No no concept. All they had was they wanted something involving the goddess Mazu. They wanted. They saw her as a, you know, this icon of Taiwanese culture, and they wanted to, and, and Asian culture at large. Uh, as an aside, to explain to the listeners at home, uh, Mazu was a mortal girl in Fujian province around 962 AD, I believe living on a coastal village and everyone there made their living from the sea. The stories go that she, you know, they didn't have lighthouses or anything like that. So she would actually wear this bright red dress and stand on the cliff as like a signal to guide people back home and uh, died in a storm swimming out to sea, trying to rescue her father from a crashed uh, fishing boat. And so basically was sort of 
you know, kind of made a saint in some ways. Uh-huh. Um, she's worshipped by something like 50 million people in 26 countries. Huh. Wow. I should double check my numbers on that, but it's a large number. You don't hey, have the to. The name of yeah. this podcast is Accuracy Third. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, we, good. We've already gotten way more accuracy in like the last two or three minutes than than we've had in any of our <laughs> previous episodes. Yeah, it was a it was a really strange journey. So I I went to you know basically they said okay well something something Mazu something something Burning mm-hmm. and their main gig at at Dream Community they do very small scale installation art on just kind of on their property essentially. Um, just sort of on the outskirts of Taipei. But their main gig are these uh, big parades they do like with floats and things like that. And they're like, we want to do this thing, but we want it to be really big at Burning Man. And I was like, well, Burning Man doesn't really <coughs> support performance art. You know, that like, if you want to bring that there, go for it. But that's not really anything that you're going to interact with the org about. You're not going to have any support. But what they do support is installation art. So if you want an installation as a stage for your performance, I'll make you one. They're like, great, do that. So I... <laughs> was, did they awesome. have funding? <laughs> Communication throughout the entire project with them was, shall we say, fraught with challenges. Oh, I can imagine. You know, no one there had English as a first language. I speak some Mandarin, which helped, but I'm, I was not fluent enough to conduct full conversations in Mandarin either. So mm-hmm. we, you know, we each spoke about one and a half languages. All that being said, when we started off, I visited some Mazu temples to kind of get a feel for it. I did some research, came up with a design, some concept art. And they're like, yeah, great. We're doing that. Sounds awesome. And so I was like, okay, cool. So, you know, you've got your letter of intent in. You guys got this, right? They're like, oh, no, no. No, you're doing this. <laughs> I was like, so I was planning on leaving here. At, okay. All right. And so I was like, okay, well, then who, who am I working with? Because they have, they have some people on site, but none of them are really who I would pick to do anything like this. They, they do a lot of small scale soft arts. Yeah. Float building. Yeah. Not installation mm-hmm. building. Right. And so the, well, you know, pick a team, you work with people. And I was like, all right. So I, I put a call out on the DPW list and suddenly this just, you know, torrent of people being like, Oh my God, this sounds amazing. I, you'll, you'll fly me out to Taiwan to work on this. Okay. I'm in. Uh, so it's coming in and I end up turning into a one man HR team for, a few weeks end up putting together a, a really talented team uh, including people who have worked on several other temples in the past um, Kiwi who was the lead for the Temple of Transition in 2011 mm-hmm. came on as an architect uh, Charlie who had spent a number of years in DPW and had worked on the temple in 09 you know as well as a lot of other large scale installation art and so on there's a, a you know amazing team I got artists and welders and a uh, costume designer and all sorts of people who are basically putting, making it this big thing. And how many people did you end up flying out for this? Uh, let's see. The core of us was about was about nine or ten of us all together. The whole thing ended up being like five and a half months of planning and design. Three and a half months of build on site at, at the generator in Reno. About two and a half weeks to set up on site. With including all of the cleanup, tear down, tying up of loose ends, it was a year of my life start to finish. And how much of the... Uh the construction and the, the fabrication and stuff was done in Taiwan. Was any of None it? None of it. Just the planning? Yeah. Uh, and the Taiwanese crew brought out, if you were there and you saw those two big statues that were sort of like foam, foam uh, kind of demon looking statues. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are actually figures from Mazu's mythology, Qian Li Yan and Shun Feng Er, which translate as Thousand Mile Eyes and Ears Hear the Wind, something like that. Mm. And basically the, the story goes, you know, Tomazu was, first she was kind of sainted uh, in this kind of this sort of quasi St. Christopher capacity, you know, protector of travelers, but primarily ocean going travelers. And then as, as sometimes happens, she sort of, you know, rose in the, the ranks and was posthumously deified. Then not really considered a deity of any particular religion. And she's kind of her own thing. Uh, the Buddhist and Taoist both tried to absorb her. Um, but in any case, part of the story goes that in her status as immortal protector, uh, these two demon generals both fall in love with her. And her response, which is wonderfully badass, was basically like, okay, if you can beat me in a fight, I'm yours. Uh, if not, you're mine. And it trounces them both soundly, and then they basically pledge to be her eternal bodyguards. So she's, she's always found flanked by these two demons. So that's, that's what those statues were. Those were made by a, actually a Balinese wood carving team that sort of is like artist in residence at Dream Community in Taiwan. Oh, cool. Yeah. 
uh, though designed by my friend John Bastard. <laughs> and then that shipped out here? Yeah. Yeah, the logistics on this entire thing were a giant clusterfuck. And just the amazing. tension of waiting for those crates to arrive and, <sighs> mm-hmm. you know, yeah. opening them to see how they fared mm-hmm. going across the Pacific, however they got to you. Matt, that would be maddening. And how much logistical and, like, administrative support did you get? Were you running this whole project? Mm-hmm. They were essentially just funding it. Yes, often not even that. The how to put it, you know, the the initial arrangement had been something like, okay, you know, you guys don't have experience building anything in the desert, building anything this scale. You know, you're hiring me to be the project manager, so I have authority to do these things. You know, you're giving me the budget, and I'm I'm running design decisions by you. But once the design is locked in and approved by the org, then I have a green light to go, and as long as I stick to budget, everything's fine. That seemed to be a reasonable way of reading that situation. Two or three times, at least two times that I can recall, after the letter of intent was submitted and approved, they called me in for radical design changes. Mm-hmm. Because in, in their mind, it was all still a work in progress. Uh-huh. It was all just spitballing still. Whereas I'm like, I need to... I, What? We gotta buy wood, <laughs> man. Yeah. Um, you know, that and if we want to get support from Burning Man, we have to do the thing that we told them we were going to do, that they said, yes, we'll give you money for that. If we do a different thing, we don't get that money. Or the logistical support or the free tickets or any of these things. You know, Dream Community was very much used to operating on their timeline, on their turf, where they can kind of just be like, yes, do this thing. And then come back a month later when you're like 80% percent like, um, no, I meant something else. <laughs> yeah that's that's artists yeah yeah well they're not artists is the thing they, they import all their artists oh so they're, they're really just the, like a patron organization kind of um they're a what i what i discovered with enough time out there was that they're basically like a they're a company that does value-added real estate development that's sort of billing itself as an artist organization huh like the guy behind it all is a real estate developer who builds these apartment buildings and then has like artists come out and, you know, live in the unfinished apartments and do installation pieces that he gives them, you know, sort of a modest stipend for. And then he finishes out the apartments and sells them and, you know, retains all of the rights and everything. Hmm. Wow. And, you know, he was using like, you know, it, it it came out much later that he was like using Mazu as like, you know, leverage to get himself to the table with these like big Chinese real estate developers and all these things. Well, that's a little disappointing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a word for it. I mean, it's not quite Belgian waffle in the car ad disappointing, but it's pretty disappointing. Yeah. Wait, how was Belgian waffle? The the car Belgian waffle, uh, I mean, Erconia, was featured in a an Audi ad. Ah, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. I didn't know that. So you've flown to Taiwan. You've planned out mm-hmm. this entire project for this uh, mm-hmm. shadowy moneyed organization you've mm-hmm. been baited uh, and switched at least <laughs> twice <laughs> oh yeah uh you you and your team have returned to nevada and mm-hmm. spent three months in reno mm-hmm. constructing this thing three months in nevada at the generator mm-hmm. which was, it was uh, kind of a kind enough to give us an enormous amount of space and use of their shop for free essentially um uh for those aren't who are not familiar with it, the generator is a makerspace uh out of Sparks, technically, but right next door to Reno. But it's where the pier and the ship were built mm-hmm. in, I believe, 11 and 12. Uh, Embrace in 2014. And then they're, where they're currently working on the Space Whale. Yes. Sort Space of a nautical theme. Whale. Yeah. Um, Trying to think of how that feeds into the whole Enlightenment theme of this year, too. And um, You don't find Space Whales in Lightning? how how much inappropriate clockwork are we going to see this year like totally steampunked out two centuries ahead not going to see any wooden gears we might we'll see a few but just one gear at a time get any wood out there it'll warp so badly teeth won't lock it doesn't have to really be wood it just has to look like wood we can 3D print it and then you know laminate it oh totally yeah like shelf paper Uh wood veneering uh, so okay. once you've got it all constructed in, uh, mm-hmm. Reno, yeah. um, th- yeah. there's a, there's a whole nother oh, adventure yeah. ahead of you. Oh yeah. Okay. So we were set to head out to Playa with our like six or seven semi loads of stuff at that point. 
you know, because we built the whole thing like a, a kit. So it was all pieces that, you know, there wasn't enough space in the generator, despite the enormous amount that we had to actually put the whole thing together. Right. Uh, so we had to do it all in pieces and do a really, really good job of double checking that everything would fit together. And we're mostly correct. Um, so we're set to head out on like the 15th or so. I'm like, okay, I want to be there first. I need to find the art department. I need to figure out where we are and be there to kind of guide in these shipments as they come so that they're not dithering around and we can kind of get this going because however much time we have is not going to be enough. You know, nothing ever goes to plan on by or takes as long as you think it will. And so we have a bunch of vehicles that we've procured through various means between people's personals and like some, you know, trailers and RVs that we've rented for the crew. And we have one that we picked up for a thousand dollars that was supposed to be the kitchen for everything uh-huh. andy who was sort of our camp manager had done a fantastic job of like putting in counters and found you know sourced all of these appliances and it was a really good kitchen um plus there was food for two weeks on this thing and set it up with the generator to run uh, to keep the freezers going and all that i was originally going to drive that out so all of my stuff was in there and when I say all of my stuff, like I'd been on the road for about three years. All of my stuff was my backpack and a bin. And that was about everything I owned. That's all loaded up and the thing won't start. And I'm like, well, okay, I got to get going. You know, you get, you know, <laughs> find the mechanic, work, you know, work this out. I'm going to take a different vehicle. And I grab my little shoulder bag. Beautiful ride out to Playa, just as the sun's coming up. Get there for dawn with uh, Chelsea, who was my pyro lead. You know, find our spot and kind of start getting things situated. And, you know, the, the rest of people who are like, yeah, we'll be there in a couple hours. We'll be right, right behind you. Five, six, seven hours go by. Finally, they show up early evening without the, the uh, kitchen trailer. And apparently it had had these persistent ongoing engine issues. It had died like three or four times. They'd, they tried pushing it. They tried pulling it. It finally limped it into Willie's yard in Gerlach and left it there to come get tools and reinforcements from Playa and head back out. Uh, but because it had, had all of this frozen food and frozen meat in it, they're like, well, you know, let's leave it with one of the generators running. That's what it's designed to do. Mm-hmm. Right as they're relaying this story to me, staff truck comes up with uh, chaos. In it. Okay, everyone. Nathan just mentioned a guy named Chaos. And that guy just happens to run the Black Rock City Heavy Equipment and Transpo, or HEAT, team. Heat deploys big construction equipment to everyone on Playa, whether you're a giant art project or one of Burning Man's departments. Chaos is the spider in the center of the web in charge of all of that. And now that you know who he is, back to the story. Chaos runs the heavy equipment department. And he's like, so was that your trailer in Gerlach? I was like, that's an interesting use of the word was. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Apparently... About 10 minutes after they'd left, it caught fire and burned to the ground oh, with everything in it. Oh, boy. Wow. You know, and, and the, the guy who had been driving it and who had made the decision to leave it, uh, it was his first time at Burning Man, his first time on Playa, and he was Canadian. He was just crippled with guilt. Literally, I don't think I've ever seen anyone that useless oh. from being sorry. And I was like, I actually need you to do work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. Um, early man was coming up. Hi friends, Rex here. You may be wondering to yourself, what is early burn? Perhaps you've never heard of this before. Early burn is a celebration for the staff and crew that put Burning Man together, held the week before the gate opens. All the various teams that work hard building the roads, building the shade, building the infrastructure, digging power trenches, etc., etc., build wooden effigies symbolizing what their department does. Stuff them full of accelerants, fireworks, and other wildly inappropriate material, and light them on fire while reveling in front of them. This eventually, inevitably leads to running from the hot, exploding fire, squealing in delight. This is how the folks that build Burning Man celebrate building Burning Man. And so I recruited him and Andy, who had actually built out the trailer, to take some spare plywood to take a couple hours for, you know, a few nights and make an effigy of the van of the trailer to go burn on purpose at early man spray painted burning van 2015 on it yeah, after that everything was fine oh what that's that's some magical playa catharsis right there i love that oh so good so what did you guys do without kitchen or food for two, two weeks. weeks yeah um we managed to actually pull together 
a really amazingly supportive community uh, very quickly. You know, between all the people who had been sort of following along our, you know, our fundraising and social media, you know, there was a there was a quick call out of like, holy shit, this just happened. You know, there was a bunch of people who were kind of coming in the second wave who had still uh, who were still in Reno who were able to take donations, were able to buy, you know, raise some funds and buy some extra food. Uh, but there was also an enormous outpouring of support from all of our friends on staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the next day, some friends of mine from Gate rolled up with a truck, and the truck bed was just full of Colexitus food. Colexitus is something that pretty much everybody who attends Burning Man knows about. It's a fixture of the Exodus experience. It's that group of DPW that sits in the line collecting your food that you're not going to take home with you. I just learned what Colexitus is yesterday. I've never left on Monday during the big parade out the door. Which is kind of a shame because Exodus is one of those touchstone experiences of Burning Man. D-Day, you're kind of missing out. You get to sit in your car in the sun, all tired and bored all day long. Colexitus collects sealed, canned, shelf-stable food. They're not interested in your water. They're not interested in your drugs. They are interested in your open containers of liquor, which can get you thrown in the who's gal if you get caught speeding on the way home. That's not actually true. They, they don't want your open containers of liquor. They'll take them, but they don't want them. Finish your own booze. Completely set on, you know, granola bowls and mac and cheese and, uh-huh. you know, all this stuff. Like, we, we were fine. I had care packages coming in almost daily for me from people who were like, holy shit, Nathan lost stuff. I don't know if you know Muse, but she's uh, she's part of the office staff. She mm-hmm. works in legal, I think. Um, and she suffered a house fire where she lost almost everything she owned some years ago. And she's like, I don't want to see that happen to my friend. Ba- and basically ordered me to set up a, an Amazon wish list of like the stuff that I'd lost personally. And so, you know, passed it around the office. And by the time I left Playa, I had almost more stuff than I went on Playa with. It was kind of incredible. It was one of the... That's that's amazing. Yeah, that's wonderfully sweet. Yeah, I have the best friends ever. I, I feel like I, I don't think I could ever thank everybody enough. My friend Seth heard that I lost my camera among the things that were there. And like, he'd stopped going to Burning Man in 2001. And he came out for Early Man just to give me his old camera, which was this much nicer one than I had. It was this big, big old DSLR. My friend Ayumi, she was coming out from Tokyo. Uh, she runs one of the Japanese burn camps called Camp Nuclear Disaster. And she heard that I had lost a knife and comes out and hands me this hand forged ninja toe. Wow. <laughs> wow. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's the most baller knife on fire. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, I was just like stunned and speechless pretty much constantly. You know, I lost a lot of my medical gear, a lot of my Western first aid kit. I was I was basically the ranking medic for Mazu uh-huh. uh, among my like twelve hats, uh, plus all of my, my acupuncture gear. And by the time I left, I had basically a like fully stocked paramedic duffel bag and a fully stocked acupuncture kit. It, it was incredible for everything that was frustrating or stressful or went wrong about that entire debacle. All of the circumstances around which everyone came out of the woodwork to be supportive for myself and my crew will always have a soft spot in my heart. You know, I think we got about 90% of what I wanted and that I think I'm the only one that was really killed by that 10%, but it, it was it was still pretty 90% pretty for a Burning Man project is unheard of. <laughs> it was also my first art project. There's got to be a word for how close you didn't get to what you wanted to begin with. I'm pretty sure that's in the dictionary of obscure sorrows. Yeah, I, I know that. I know that if it's a bottle of liquor, it's called the ullage. The ullage. Yeah, the empty space in that bottle of whiskey uh-huh. is the ullage. Oh, oh, fascinating! I just learned um, a new word. I got a, I got a nice scar here on my hand. I got to say, it was a dragon bite. The eight dragons that lined the perimeter of the roof drew blood every fucking day that we worked on them. Uh, uh, I believe it. They were sharp as fuck. Yeah. I, I was seriously considering at one point just renaming the whole thing the Temple of Tetanus. <laughs> <laughs> the music you've been listening to is by Koi Wolf. If you'd like to find out more about them or the other artists whose music we've featured in this podcast, please visit the podcast music page of our website, accuracythird.com. Next week, you're going to hear an episode with several stories around a single theme. This is something we've been threatening you with for some time. If you like next week's episode and you want to hear more of these thematic episodes or you want to get your story on our podcast in any form, go to our website, use the submit link, tell us your story, and we'll share it with everyone else. Accuracy Third is edited by Drunk Beth. Our theme music is by Jim and Damien. 
Accuracy Third is distributed under the Creative Commons license. Accuracy Third is produced by Accuracy Third, which is D-Day, Rex, and Beth. Thanks for listening.